Hi, I'm Brian, and in this video I'll be talking about PySynd, a Python package for the sparse identification of nonlinear dynamical systems. Uh, we've got co our code is up on GitHub, and there's a documentation site as well. I'll show these links again at the end of the video. Uh, so today I'll be talking to you about, first of all, what the sparse identification of nonlinear dynamical systems, or SYND algorithm is. I'll talk about how you can use PySYND to back out uh, governing dynamical systems from measurement data. I'll go a little, I'll talk a little bit about the structure of PySYND, and then I'll briefly give an overview of some of the more advanced features of PySYND. Uh, so we'll start with a motivating example. Um, let's say I have conducted an experiment where I took a particle, uh, placed it at some point in space, and then watched it evolve in time, taking measurements every 0.01 seconds for, say, 10 seconds. I then want to try to come up with a model that allows me to predict the behavior of the particle starting at other points in space. Uh, so the first thing I'll do is just plot uh, some measurement data that uh, someone gives me. Um, so the particle starts out down there, and then over time it oscillates upward in this way. Uh, so one method I could, do, I could use to try to come up with governing equations is uh, the Cindy method. Uh, this gives me a way to translate the measurement data into a plausible dynamical system governing the time evolution of the, of the system. Uh, so what what it tries to do is take the measurement data um, x and then find a function f that governs how its derivative behaves. Uh, so the key observation behind Cindy is that often uh, each of the component functions of f, so um, the derivatives of each of the different measurement variables, tend to be sparse in the space of possible um, functions. So for example, uh, if we write down this uh, fi, and we write it as a linear combination of some basis functions. In many, if we pick those basis functions in a smart way, then most of these coefficients will end up being zero. So Cindy tries to use sparse regression to find these coefficients. Uh, what the algorithm looks like um, in a little more detail is that first we're going to take our data and stack it into this big data matrix X, where each column corresponds to a different measurement variable, and each row corresponds to a different point in time. We'll also form a derivative matrix, x dot, um, which is just the time derivatives of all these points. Um, if you aren't able to form that uh, for measurement based directly on measurement data, then you can often infer it by differentiating the measurement data. So Python, you'll be able to do that automatically. The next thing we'll do is pick a set of basis functions to form um, our library matrix, uh, capital theta. Uh, so as an example, uh, one of these function, basis functions might be polynomials of degree two. And so what that submatrix would look like would just be um, all the different um, quadratic combinations of the measurement variables. And these vector products and powers are understood to be carried out element-wise. Uh, so the final thing we need to do is find um, a set of sparse coefficient vectors that satisfies this uh, approximation problem, or that approximately solves this problem. Uh, so um, the ith column of this matrix corresponds to the coefficients for the ith uh, coordinate function of f, or the ith variable, the ith measurement variable. This plot here just shows um, an overview of what the Cindy method looks like for uh, if it were applied to the Lorentz equations. So we measure the state um, from uh, the Lorentz system. Uh, we then obtain a derivative matrix, and we try to uh, to fit this, these library functions, in this case, the library consists of polynomials of degree up to five, uh, we try to find a sparse linear combination of them that recreates the dynamics. So that sparse matrix is identifying the active terms from the library. Uh, and hopefully what we get out at the end of the day is something that looks similar to uh, the original model that, that generated the data in the first place. Uh, so how does this uh, connect to Pi Cindy? Well, PySynd basically has one submodule dedicated to each of the three terms in the approximation problem we saw before. So PySynd.differentiate is going to help us form this, uh, this derivative matrix x dot. PySynd.feature library is going to help us form this library matrix theta. And then PySynd.optimizers uh, provides sparse regression techniques for 
computing Xi. Uh, the core object in PySyndy is the Cindy class, and the Cindy class has three major attributes that also um, reflect the three different terms in this approximation problem. So it's got a differentiation method, a feature library, and an optimizer uh, corresponding to each of these three sub objects in each of these three submodules. So what does it look like to actually apply PySyndy to the data? Um, so let's go ahead and import PySyndy and then form a Cindy model with all of the default um, attributes. What does that look like if we print it out? It's a little bit hard to parse, but basically it's got a differentiation method, which in this case is a finite difference method. It's got a feature library consisting of polynomial features of degree up to two. Um, and it's got an optimizer, uh, which in this case is the sequentially thresholded least squares algorithm, which um, was the, the method proposed in the original Cindy paper um, for solving uh, the approximation problem. So how do we actually fit it to the data? Well, first we're gonna quickly just form a T vector corresponding to all the points in time where we took our measurements, and then we're just gonna apply model.fit to the um, data and the time, the time points. Uh, printing out that model, we get something that looks like this. So the differential equation for the first coordinate, it, or the first measurement variable is kind of complicated. Uh, the second one is relatively simple. Let's see how well it fits the data. To do that, we can, one way to do that is to use the simulate function, which allows us to simulate uh, this discovered model forward in time from some different initial condition. In this case, we'll just pass in the same initial condition as the original data, and then just see how um, this new model stacks up. So it does a pretty, it does a qualitatively decent job of, um, of mimicking the dynamics from the original system, but it's not a spot on match. So let's try to see if we can do better. Um, so notice that the data is kind of, looks like it might be sort of periodically oscillating. So maybe that's a hint that we should be looking at trigonometric functions instead of polynomial functions for our library. Uh, so to do that, we can apply the, um, we can, rather than passing, rather than using the default library of polynomials, we can use a Fourier library, which is a built-in method. This is just gonna be um, a set of sine and cosine functions with different frequencies. Um, so uh, we pass that in, in the feature library um, attribute, and then I'm also passing in some feature names. That's just gonna make um, the printed version of the equations involve X and Ys rather than X naughts and X ones. Uh, so if we fit that new model, um, we get something that looks like this. So the first, uh, the, the derivative of x looks like a nice simple function of y. Um, the derivative of y looks kind of, still looks pretty complicated. Let's go ahead and simulate out in time and see um, how, the perform, how the model did. Uh, so it's even worse than before in this case. Um, the one thing to note is that the um, second equation has a bunch of terms in it, um, which indicates that either potentially the threshold we set was too low, allowing lots of um, non-informative terms into the model, or it could be the case that we aren't using an expressive enough library, so we're not able to capture the dynamics. Uh, so what we'll do to get around that is we will, um, use a different, uh, increase the threshold to eliminate some of those um, noisier terms and also set the fit intercept um, parameter to be true. What that's gonna do is allow um, constant functions into the library. Uh, so to do that, we're going to um, specify those parameters in the optimizer and then pass in both uh, the, new, the Fourier library and this new optimizer and then still the feature names. If we do all that, the model we get um, looks nice and clean. Uh, so this seems like maybe a good candidate model. Uh, if we apply it to the data, simulate it forward in time, we see that, yeah, the fit is really good. Uh, so this seems like it's probably the model we wanna use or something close to it. Uh, so now that I've walked through an example, I just wanna mention some advanced features I didn't have time to get to today. Um, so. PySyndy has um, a, another built-in optimizer, SR3, which is a generalization of the sequentially thresholded least squares method. Um, but we've also made it very easy to use third-party sparse regression techniques um, as optimizers. So check out the examples for uh, 
um, a way, uh, the examples on, in the documentation uh, to see how to use lasso or elastic net from the SK Learn package as optimizers. Uh, we have extra differentiation methods built in for handling noisier data sets. Um, there's more customization available for forming your library matrix. Uh, Pycini can also handle multiple different sets of initial conditions. So if I, rather than just uh, taking one trajectory and feeding it in, if I had, say, run five experiments and started the particle at five different points in space and then evaluated those forward in time, I could pass all those in to PyCindy and um, have the Cindy object um, use all that information to try to find an appropriate model. PyCindy can handle discrete time uh, uh, dynamical systems or maps, so something like the logistic equation. Um, we also have some extra built-in scoring functions if you want to measure performance in other ways than just uh, plotting. Uh, so I'll wrap up with just, by just showing, uh, listing some resources um, to help get you started. So the code is on GitHub. We have a documentation site. We recently put out a paper on the archive that delves into more of the background around Cindy and tells you about um, other things that have been done in the Cindy um, area. And we also have the original Cindy paper, um, which goes into more mathematical background behind Cindy. Uh, I really quickly just want to show uh, the GitHub page. Um, so we've got um, kind of a little bit more about how the method works. Uh, we've got some installation instructions, all that good stuff. Um, the documentation site has, um, has documentation for the API, but also there are lots of examples of how to apply Cindy uh, to different systems. Um, we've go gone ahead and recreated um, or reproduced all of the examples from the original Cindy paper um, as a notebook um, in the documentation. All right, uh, thanks for watching, that's it.